A very good morning to all. On behalf of KRPIA, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Majahid Ali and thank him for taking time out for this talk. In today's talk, Best Practices in Urban and Rural Development, Mr. Majahid Ali touches upon 80 TC interventions in northern Pakistan, along with their major work in Lahore. He holds a BR degree from Pakistan, an MR degree from the UK, and an additional master's degree in cultural economics from Italy. Currently, Mr. Rajahat Ali serves as the Director of Conservation and Design at the Aga Khan Cultural Service Pakistan. In the 22-year association with ATCSP, his primary focus has been on the planning of conservation of heritage buildings in the northern region of Pakistan as well as in Lahore. Mr. Rajahat Ali has had the privilege of contributing to several prominent projects, including the conservation of 400-year-old Shigar Fort, Khapu Paris, the 900-year-old Altit Fort, the Mughal era Shahi Hamam, and the Wazir Khan Mosque in Lahore. Currently, he is leading the conservation efforts at the World Heritage Site of Lahore Fort, which involves the restoration of the world's largest funeral picture wall, as well as the preservation of the Shish Mahal, Summer Palace, and the establishment of a visitors and interpretation center as central components. In addition to his role at ATCSP, he is also associated with the World Heritage Institute of Training and Research as an observer for Pakistan. Furthermore, he holds memberships in several professional organizations, including ICOMOS Pakistan, the Pakistan Council of Architects and Town Planners, and the Institute of Architects Pakistan. We will now start the talk. I, am I audible to the audience, please? Uh, am I audible, please? Yes, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Uh, if you could turn on your camera, um, then it would be nice to see you. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes. So, uh, so my name, uh, thank you for uh, a brief uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Wajahat Ali and I'm a conservation architect. And I work at Al Khan. Uh, Cultural Service Pakistan uh, as a director of conservation and design and I'm, as I you mentioned that I'm associated with this organization for last 22 years. Long time I guess and today uh, I try to present how uh, the work of Al Khan Cultural Service Pakistan has impacted the rural and urban societies where they use culture as a development tool. So to, you know, majority of presentation will be uh, will be presented by myself, but I have a colleague, uh, Ms. Zaina Nasir. Uh, she will be, you know, giving you details how science, how science is important for uh, uh, restoration of buildings and how science has impacted, you know, at least uh, uh, Pakistani uh, society and how how the impacts are uh, going deep into the society. So my colleague Zaina uh, is also online now, and once her part is there, I'll request her to uh, present. So now, uh, uh, coming back to the uh, coming back to the presentation, since I represent Aga Khan Trust for culture. The objective of Al Khan Trust for Culture is, uh, let me read that, I'll read this, undertaking the sustainable restoration and rehabilitation of historical structures and public spaces in a way that spur economic and cultural development. So for, for Al Khan Trust for Culture, it's not just mere, uh, you know, building restoration. It is linked with, you know, uh, creating jobs, you know, creating positive impact to the society. And I'll, 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 through my presentation, I'll try to explain 
through examples that how uh, that was done. So what is Aga Khan Development Network? Aga Khan Trust for Culture or Aga Khan Culture Service Pakistan is part of Aga Khan Development Network. This is one of the largest uh, development. Uh, 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 yes, sir, you can go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Is my screen vis visible to everyone because my presentation is mostly visuals and my talk is sub fully supported by visuals. So I want everyone to see the visuals as well. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the screen is visible. OK, so. As a part of, uh, you know, as I was mentioning that um, Aga Khan Cultural Service Pakistan is part of larger Aga Khan Development Network where, you know, they have a separate, you know, uh, you know, sector where they have used probably the only body out there in the world where culture has been used as a development tool, you know. Mostly we have seen out there in the world that, you know, economic development is there, of course, you know, by building roads, factories, social development, you, you know, address, you know, uh, poverty through, you know, uh, you know, social, you know, development of social infrastructure, but we rarely see anything that is, you know, related to culture. So the Aga Khan Development Network has used culture as a, as a tool to address poverty, to, you know, enhance life. And uh, we are part of that. And uh, as a, since our, our, our motto or goal is, you know, uh, you know, mostly, you know, physical intervention, so we are part of uh, you. You will see in the in the right chart. Uh, you will see Aga Khan Historical Cities Program. So here I represent our Aga Khan Historical Cities Program, where through building restoration, rehabilitation of you know uh, settlements or you know uh, or cities, we try to evoke life in in in, in still build the life into those you know structures to bring them back to life and you know uh, improve the lives of the people exactly. who live around that. I think when we um, see uh, this chart is a perfect example that um, heritage conservation or a building heritage or heritage conservation can can create a lot of impact. It can have a social uh, or cultural impact because once you restore a building, you know you know the pride of the society who owns who believe that that heritage is theirs. Uh, their Pride enhances, you know. Uh, again, you know, it is also linked with environmental responsibility or environmental impact, I would say. Uh, you know, historical buildings tend to utilize uh, indigenous material. Like in case of uh, Lahore, here what we use is all local material. There is no important material. Of course, you, you address, uh, you know, the important issue, the global issue of uh, environmental protection, you know, by utilizing local material, local techniques. Similarly, um, heritage conservation is also linked with economical impact or economical responsibilities there. How you do that once you once you work on the project or a historical building, you create a lot of job during the work. And once that work is completed, a lot of tourism comes to that area. A lot of, you know, economic opportunity opportunities, uh, you know, become available to the local residents. So heritage conservation can, uh, you know, uh, spur uh, the real life, uh, not into the building itself, uh, the subject matter, but, you know, the, so in the society in general, it can address. So this is the map of Pakistan. You, I'm sure uh, everyone knows about that. Uh, so these are the areas, you know, the red dot is Lahore. This is our urban context and the areas up in the north, we call Gilgit Baltistan is where our contrast for culture has intervened in last three decades. So I'll I'll begin my presentation with this green, you know, shaded, shaded areas uh, where uh, uh, this is the uh, rural context. I would I would call you know the the, the area is very uh, hard to live, uh, particularly in winters. Uh, but it 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 gives you the unique opportunity, you know, uh, because of the isolation, because of you know it was cut off uh, from the rest of the world because of the terrain. I would say uh, difficulty to communicate, difficulty to travel. Uh, the heritage was intact some three three decades back, and this the area available for agriculture is barely two percent. So it was a good opportunity for Aga Khan uh, Culture Service Pakistan to. Uh, 
to go and you know or do the uh, rightly you know in the right time uh, heritage conservation so they began uh, working on on these uh, uh, important monuments i would uh, start uh, the, the the intervention was started in 1990s you know when al khan trust for culture started working on the uh, baltit fort this was uh, Our most uh, structure from 14th century, almost 700 years. Uh, it was in a bad shape. Uh, through a restoration effort of six years, it was restored. And uh, not only the the monument was restored, but you know the context around that, the settlements around that. Again, I would um, call uh, our intervention up in the northern Pakistan is um, is not monument centric. It is community driven, uh, you know, conservation. A local uh, community organizations were formed with that acted as a as a, a civil society or a pressure group uh, uh, to you know address their issues on priority. Uh, you know, our contrast for culture engaged them the, from the day first. Uh, engage uh, uh, them from the day first, and you know uh, the end result is uh, a structure like this, and the context, and and this 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 one structure can you know generate enough uh, for the whole area. You know, it is it we call it as a, a economic engine. Uh, it was a dead structure uh, before 1996. Now this has turned into something that the whole you know the majority of the town depends on. You know the tourist who comes to visit this place. Of course, they stay in in, in the hotels. They buy from the uh, local uh, grocery shops or handicraft shops. They, you know, they use their you know transport service. So, so the whole economy, you know, of that area uh, runs on this particular uh, project. Similarly, this is another project, um, Shiger Fort. I was part of the team. I was a part of the conservation team. Uh, it was an effort of four year, and uh, this was in a shamble. I would say when I was there uh, in 2000, the only thing visible was was the dust. You know, it was a dusty structure, a collapsed structure. Uh, now this has uh, the Baltic Fort. The previous project was, you know, as was transformed into a museum. But this was a palace, so this was partially transformed into a museum. But majority of spaces have been dedicated as a residential room. You know, you go, you pay, you stay. So a lot of money comes from this. A lot of additional jobs were created through uh, these projects. So this, these are some visuals. You know, the picture on right is is a museum part. Uh, you know, the audience hall uh, where uh, the local uh, you know ruler used to meet the you know people of his uh, royalty. We have transformed that room into a into a audience hall or exhibition hall. And the, the other rooms, which were the residential rooms, have been converted into a I would say world-class uh, residential boutique uh, hotel, very famous uh, not only in Pakistan but globally. Uh, if you see this particular one picture, it it tells you the the society, uh, the, the the story it, in in a in a in a summary form that the building at the top was the as found condition, and it was abandoned for 50 years. You know, ab abandoned for 50 years. Now because of this intervention, the whole area has become a spotlight. You name any person, you know, you name any person who visit that area, stays there, and you know, brings a lot of you know good for the for the people and the society or the villages around. They benefit a lot from uh, from from uh, from this project, uh, either through direct jobs or indirect jobs. Uh, maybe uh, jobs created in, in in if not thousands, then you know in hundreds uh, by this project. And these are small villages you know the the total population of the, uh, the whole gilgit baltistan is 2 million imagine 2 million maybe a neighborhood in mumbai has more population than than this whole area but this one project has created uh, jobs in hundreds so it's a big number it's a big number given the context we have this is another uh, port uh, this is the oldest surviving structure in not only in pakistan but in western himalaya This include parts of India, Nepal, China, Pakistan. So this is almost uh, more than thousand year old. Uh, this structure was restored in 2007. And again, uh, the the formation, the morphology, or the architectural configuration suggested to convert this into only a museum. So this this particular fort, like Balti Fort, 
has been uh, converted into a, a museum. Uh, just look at the, the context, you know, the high mountains and the placement of uh, fort uh, perching at the top of the settlement. The settlement uh, below the fort is again very historical. So again, the, the aim of uh, Khan transport culture was not to focus on only on monument, but uh, the process was community driven. You know, before starting the fort itself, the community context, the historical core was rehabilitated by provision of, you know, uh, sanitation, water supply, underground electrification, improvement of their community areas, community historical buildings. And again, the best part of this whole process, as I mentioned earlier, that community has been engaged from the day first, and they also contribute in, in terms of, you know, in-kind uh, labor services or in, 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 in terms of, you know, uh, they, they they have a share in uh, it's not just only a donors comes pay you money for restoration no not like that they 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 become part of it by provision of shares in kind share or sharing in in terms of uh, you know grants so this was another project uh, this is uh, another one uh, this is not far from uh, the you know uh, I would call it from Indian uh, side this is uh, towards the northeastern part of uh, Gilgit Baltistan uh, near Ladakh. This is Kapolo Palace, uh, more than 200, uh, around 200 years. It was again abundant structure. Uh, this has been converted into a residential uh, boutique, residential facility, as well as uh, a museum for a day visitors. People come, they stay. And these are some of the lounges. Uh, you know, I remember these were abundant structure. The whole uh, roof was full hips. It was collapsed, so we had that lot of effort to, you know, uh, not by not dismantling the old structure, uh, carefully consolidate it, whatever remains were there, and you know, added, you know, the missing part, and the result is quite satisfying. And these are the boutique hotels, um, and you know, interestingly, you know, community has has a full role in in, in the running these operations. Of course, uh, operations is done by a professional uh, body, but you know the People who are employed in these projects are 100% local people from the local community. They get direct employment, indirect. Other than this, they also get, you know, overall share of 30% from, from, from the earning. So it's, it's, it's mostly community, going back to the community, going back to the community. Because of this, you know, people realize and community realize and they own it. You know, this is the ultimate goal of uh, Afghan transport culture, to empower people through heritage conservation and to give them back, not just uh, mere talk or just to restore a physical brick, mud and water. No, just give them back in shape of jobs, in shape of money, in shape of other opportunities, trainings. So these four projects in that part has created that uh, that uh, that mass. Other than this, uh, Al Khan Transport Culture has also restored historical monuments like these are the mosques. This is one of the oldest mosques. Uh, in the area and other than these uh, historical settlements or historical neighborhoods uh, which were abandoned, people uh, migrated from these uh, historical ports to the other areas uh, because of Aga Khan transport culture effort. Now they are coming back to uh, in these uh, monuments, you know, and these are some of the visuals. Uh, I remember this was a no-go area for some time because this was all uh, haunted space. No one used to live. But because of intervention, now people are coming back. They prefer to live in this, these historical courts because the facilities have been provided in terms of water supply, electricity, sanitation. And people love to come back. And now this is full of life. And this is what our current transport culture aim is to you know, give energy or give life to all that spaces and create kind of uh, uh, opportunities, uh, economic opportunities. So before I close the ruler context, I think uh, I would say that um, uh, these projects have created a great impact uh, in terms of pluralism. Uh, how I say, why I say this pluralism, because uh, these structures had a, a Buddhist influence. In certain st structures, we have a Sikh influence, we have a, uh, you know, influences from other religions. So people, while restoring, while giving, uh, you know, restoring those structures, they tend to respect, oh, our past had uh, Buddhist interests. So this connection, you know, has, has developed because of this, this, this project. You know, 
even the radicalization in every society. It's, I'm not just only talking about Pakistan. It's everywhere in India, in everywhere. These projects act as a, a soft uh, kind of a binding element. You know, you you see that your forefathers had a um, Sikh, uh, you know, influence or a Buddhist influence. Now they tend to respect that. You know, so this is. Uh, uh, one of the major impacts, again, uh, uh, financial viability, as I mentioned, that a lot of money goes back to uh, to the community, even 30% uh, of the uh, net profit goes back to the community. These projects has, have have uh, won uh, international recognition, uh, UNESCO awards, for instance. So now what is happening? Because of these um, recognition, a lot of, uh, it pulls tourists, you know, if there is a World Heritage Site, people tend to visit that. And if a project has one UNESCO Heritage Award, people tend to visit that. Uh, this has increased the number of tourists to the area. Of course, when tourists are increased, tourism is increased. But, you know, pouring of money is also increased to the uh, to the community. Uh, of course, it has increased the tourism demand. And pride in identity, I would say, you know, pride in identity, uh, that is something which is uh, free of cost if you think um, uh, thoroughly uh, these projects has uh, has enhanced that you know people take a lot of pride in, in their heritage they don't dismantle any more heritage they tend to it's giving them you know it's giving them kind of uh, an example and this sugar has created that mass that example that a heritage can be saved and it can be used for uh, transforming the lives so these are just uh, uh, some of the summary of uh, the impacts and as you see, a lot of tourism, a lot of intellectual tourism has increased. And these are just numbers, you know, in the northern areas of Gilgit, Pakistan, uh, yeah. one music school has been established. Three social enterprises were created. Four major landmarks were were conserved. Twelve UNESCO awards have been uh, have been received. So this is just a summary of uh, our, in, uh, our intervention. And given the scale of the project or given the scale of the area and population, this is a huge, huge contribution. Now coming back to Lahore, uh, this is a journal map of Lahore. And uh, and, and, and the, the dot you see is the brown dot is, is the wall city where we, where we were. And, and this is a greater Lahore. And uh, if you compare um, Lahore, some, 400 years ago and now, that that, that that dot is from 17th century, 14th, 15th century. Now the city has been expanded uh, exponentially uh, towards uh, south, uh, and 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 there is no control. So so now let's come back to the actual uh, project. So we uh, work in Lahore since 2007. And our area of intervention in Lahore is the wall city of Lahore. The wall city of Lahore. It is, I mean, um, historical facts. This area is, has been inhabited for the last 1,000 1, years. But, you know, proper fortification was done uh, during Emperor Akbar time. Uh, it was a fortified uh, wall uh, structure or a city uh, with control gates. 13 gates were, uh, were there. And the area is 2.5 square kilometer, uh, and the population is um, about 200,000 people. It is highly dense area. Uh, there, the building stock of this area is 20,000. We have documented each building, and 10% has is is the historical. Uh, I mean, this is the you know the remains of uh, historical buildings is hardly 10%, and, and we are trying to control the damage because of the urban commercialization of this area, historical buildings are on a continuous part of dismantling and people tend to, you know, build new structure uh, as a replacement. So we are trying to convince uh, through authority uh, not to dismantle, preserve and, you know, use that uh, as, a, as a source of uh, economic engine. So the upper part is the whole wall city. And the lower part you see on the left, lower left is the famous uh, Mughal monument by Lahore Fort, where also we are also working in the wall city and in Lahore Fort. And on your right is uh, the famous uh, Bachai Mosque, like the one in uh, India, in uh, Delhi, uh, uh, similar to that. Uh, uh, Lahore Fort is uh, bigger than 
uh, red fort in India in Delhi. And the mosque is also bigger than the one in, in, in Delhi. In the center is Samadhi, uh, is a Sikh structure, and on the below uh, center is, is also a Samadhi of Ranjit Singh. And one of the Sikh gurus uh, is, is, has been cremated there. So this core is, is this whole assemblage has a, uh, I mean, it's a value of international, you know, uh, level. You know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it has a potential uh, to be uh, included in this whole area, included in uh, World Heritage Site. But currently, the only Lahore fort is, is, is inscribed in, in, in Lahore, uh, in the World Heritage Site. So these, these are just some visuals showing how uh, the uh, historical landmark is is uh, is has an impact on the urban urban context. So we we are here in uh, since 2007. We developed strategic plan for Wall City. Uh, we have also done demonstrative project in in, uh, in the Wall City of the Hor, and we have done uh, two major monuments. One is uh, Mughal era uh, historical public bathhouse, probably the only only bathhouse public bathhouse in subcontinent and and the mosque the wazir khan mosque from Shah, i mean these structures are mostly from emperor shah jahan's time 1620s 30s so this was the since we are uh, historical cities program so we have a affiliation or affinity with historical centers you know our contrast for culture this was you know some of the visuals showing how local residents used to live uh, these are some of the uh, projects we have carried out and these are uh, pre-conservation and you can see you can see great difference between these pictures how it looked like before our intervention and this is how these buildings have been transformed and because of these you know the the tourist flock in you know is a on the weekends is full of tourists full of tourists you know you know giving injection to the local uh, you know economy uh, just you, you can see the difference if i show you these pictures just concentrate on these pictures because i think pictures i mean these pictures are self explanatory so you can relate with this one and a lot of tourists particularly international tourists uh, uh, visit uh, these structures and uh, and because of this demonstrative project it has given sense to the rest of the a neighborhoods to uh, kind of approach the government of Pakistan or our countries for culture or you know uh, replication of the similar model. This is the whole whole you know one of the major bazaars uh, in in one of the neighborhoods we have done on the top left is how it used to be on right uh, what we have done and you can see the change you know how the whole uh, um, area has been transformed as a urban rehabilitation project. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects. I was part of the team, and this is uh, 17th century uh, hammam. It was a kind of, uh, it was not used as a, as a hammam. It was a school. It was a police center. It was a vocational training. 2014, uh, 13, we came to know about this. We approached uh, government of Punjab, and they handed out that structure to us. And this on the left, this was structure, you know, it was encroached. Uh, through uh, with 50 more than 50 shops and now on the right you can see how it was freed it was freed from these encroachments and now this is one of the best uh, I think conservation projects uh, if not in South uh, Asia maybe maybe in Pakistan uh, you know the one uh, I think it's a pure uh, building conservation projects and 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 reclamation of original bath bathing features were exposed. Uh, in, in, in this effort. Uh, these are, uh, you know, this particular picture on the left is uh, a, a water bath, old water bath area. It was all covered with marble. It was uh, it was an investigation that, that helped us to, you know, uh, go back to the original levels and we have tried to expose. And the paintings, whatever you see on the walls are original and we have tried not to recreate complete uh, to you know, to give uh, our share of the originals, and it is a favorite uh, tourist uh, uh, spot in, in in Pakistani context or in a Lahore context. This is a mosque uh, uh, next in that same neighborhood, Wazir Khan Mosque. One of the most 
one of the most decorated Mughal monuments uh, with frescoes and tile work. It is almost completed by us. Uh, this on the left, you see, this was also encroached through shops. And now it has been freed from these, uh, you know, uh, covering, uh, you know, eyesores. And now it's freed. And, uh, and the monumental look is back. And it's not just the look, the use of the space is back. This was the, you imagine, you know, a, a mosque from 17th century has been used like this, you know, the outer area. Now it is uh, used for cultural activities, religious activities, and um, this is how it looked like. This is effort of uh, four years. So these are some visuals. Just look at the context of, I, I like this project, you know, I mean, personally, I, this is the most favorite project uh, 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 in the wall city for me, just look how it used to be, you know, uh, the neighborhood of, uh, uh, of Wazir Khan Mosque. Just look how the transport, this is magical. I, I call it a miracle, you know. Our counterpart in government of Punjab call it a miracle. And I think this is a miracle from here to here uh, is, a, is a great uh, change. And uh, these are some visuals and look at the use, you know. It was a parking yard before our intervention, and it was like steel walls. I mean, not compatible with the mosque or maybe with the historical monument of that structure. Now life is back. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 20,000 structures in 2.5 square kilometers, very dense area, hardly any space for breathe. Now locals come to this area to celebrate, to breathe, you know. This is a breathing. It's a lung for, uh, lung for the whole city of Lahore. This is the only open area, I mean, which was, which was occupied because of our intervention, life is back. And now coming back to uh, the World Heritage Site of Lahore, um, interesting site, interesting site. Uh, it has a unique site. It has a Hindu uh, temple from Lo, Lo, I mean, the Lahore itself, the name was given from this temple, Loh Temple, you know. Uh, we have a structure uh, that contains religious painting, uh, Christian religious painting. We have a Sikh, uh, number four is a Sikh uh, um, temple. We have, of course, most, so, I mean, the only site in Pakistan which represents for religious uh, expressions, you know, very rare site in Pakistan, uh, even in India, you know, uh, where uh, harmony or coexistence is becoming radicalized and not acceptable. So these projects can create that softer side and, uh, and to, you know, address these issues. And, and we are trying to uh, restore these monuments and, you know, uh, do, you know, reduce that gap that has been created uh, in the last 30, 40 years. So this Lahore Fort has this great dimension that it has. So this is the context, the center, uh, the next to Lahore Fort is the mosque, the, Emperor Alamgir that built for their mosque in around 1670s, uh, one of the biggest mosques out there in the world. Uh, on the left is uh, Sikh Samadhi. In the center is a Huzuri Bagh built by the the, the great uh, local emperor Ranjit Singh, uh, the great Sikh em uh, emperor Ranjit Singh. These are some of the uh, features from the World Heritage Site of Lahore. It has uh, a network of uh, um, waterworks, uh, fountains, cascades. It has on the, see on the uh, lower left is Petrodora work, the inlay work. I mean, it was borrowed by Mughals from Italy. Um, I mean, I would say from, from Florence. Uh, uh, of course, it's very similar to uh, Taj Mahal. It has, um, you know, uh, this famous, uh, I mean, a lot of fresco work. Lot of guild work, uh, one of the paintings uh, showing Hindu deities uh, in the Shish Mahal, and on the right is the Shish Mahal, you know, the sh uh, glass work. So, a lot of uh, unique uh, decorative features have been used in different spaces of Lahore Fort. Uh, these are, you know, uh, we have divided uh, the fort into different quadrangles uh, as per the configuration and as per the, uh, you know, uh, various, uh, for various reasons, you know. These are just uh, and we are working here, uh, uh, you know, on, you know, as one of our major projects, our first project in Lower Fort was the conservation of picture wall. I mean, uh, probably you are not aware of this. This is the world's uh, 
I think uh, the largest mural, 100,000 square feet of surface area from uh, 17th century with a lot of tile work, uh, fresco, marble, uh, Petra Dora, cut and dress brick work. So I would, uh, I think, uh, I would request, you know, uh, since my colleague is also online, uh, Zaina Nasir, she would explain how the process of science was fully utilized. That uh, I think is for the first time in Pakistan. Uh, because Pakistan, when we talk about conservation in Pakistan, it, it means you have to create everything new, reconstruct. But that concept has been has been has been you know uh, corrected through this project, where preservation uh, was given more focus than rather than reconstruction. Zena, can you please uh, share your? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, are you sharing your screen? No, I'll be uh, using your screen. Okay, you can explain. I'll then change uh, the slides. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Jad Saab, for a very good um, summary of what AKTC has been doing in Pakistan. Um, as uh, Jad Saab said, so the picture wall is the world's uh, largest mural. Uh, and when I say that, I mean that it's the largest um, decorated wall that exists anywhere in the world. So it's around um, 1,600 feet long and on average it's 60 feet tall. So what you see on this uh, slide, for example, is that um, above let's say 45 to 50 feet you have these structures on top of the wall right and these are all the main buildings um, in the fort that were mostly uh, for use by the royalty so um, the shorter side uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor the shorter side is the western facade uh, which is where the main entrance is today this is the western and facade the... sorry let me, let me uh, laser. Oh, this is the western facade Yes. Uh, you carry on, Zena. Sorry, have you changed the slide? No, no. Okay. And the northern side, which is the longer side, um, actually flew. Uh, you had the river Ravi flowing next to it, right? So uh, you can imagine that this was a moat area initially. Uh, and it's where, for example, elephant animal fights would happen. And this was completely an area that was in private use, right? So the public entrance was not from here as it is today from the western side. You had the river flowing on the north side, and this was not meant um, for private use, you know? And the reason this is important is because uh, this is a wall that's fully decorated from head to toe with tile work, mostly kashikari, uh, glazed tile work, and uh, fresco wall paintings. These are the two main modes of decoration. Uh, and it's uh, important because, you know, uh, such richly, intricately decorated areas are normally in the interior, which are in use by the emperors and their families, right? Uh, to have this once, uh, like one of a kind decorated wall uh, in the entire Mughal Empire and all the empires in the world, and to have it not for private use is a very um, interesting case. And you don't see this in other forts even in India. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Uh, Zena, I would change the slides. Oh, OK. Uh, I can't. It's still the same one on my. OK, there we go. So um, so in terms of the picture wall, and this is uh, relevant overall to the fort, that the main uh, source of deterioration and damage that it's gone through is because of the dismantling of the drainage system that mostly happened during the British uh, rule. So the British were living in the fort after they annexed from uh, Ranjit Singh's sons who were fighting succession wars. So the Sikh Empire had really, really weakened after Ranjit Singh's death. Uh, till before that, um, the British had annexed, as you all probably know, uh, Delhi, uh, most of the areas of the subcontinent and even Punjab, but they were not able to annex uh, the Punjab area that was ruled by the Sikhs. And it's because of uh, the success of Ranjit Singh's military campaigns that that was the case. But after his death, um, you know, things weren't going that well for the empire. And the British finally took over and built their residence in the fort. 
And when they did that, uh, you know, they dismantled a lot of the drainage systems in uh, the process of making some new buildings, dismantling others to make pathways for ramps and roads to get in their vehicles. They made tennis lawn courts and, you know, so a lot of the drainage that they rerouted. So the original Mughal drainage was very, very sophisticated, right? And you had uh, water going through, circulated throughout the buildings, you know, circulating in the fort and then exiting the fort, like you see in all the forts in India also. Uh, so dismantling it meant that the water was no longer exiting the fort the way it should have. Uh, they made a lot of terracotta spouts uh, sticking out of the picture wall. So for example, here, when you see, uh, so here you see on top of the wall, uh, you know, there are some panels on the upper level that are completely ruined. Uh, and the reason for that is that you have water spouts sticking right on top of the panel. So all you can imagine that. So basically, in a short summary, what the British did was that all the water inside the fort was getting accumulated and leaving out on the picture wall, right? So literally uh, throwing all the wa water that's accumulated in the fort during the monsoon rains uh, onto the wall. So imagine 200 years of that constant water soakage, especially during the monsoons where you have heavy, heavy rainfalls, just like you do in Delhi. And, um, you know, uh, so constant moisture uh, and on top of that you have 200 years of complete neglect uh, not only from the british but then later on this was handed on uh, to the asi and then the asi was split after partition now you have the punjab archaeology department and now it's under the wall city lahore authority uh, the 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 heritage site uh, but you know as wajahat sahab was saying conservation has never been done in the true sense of the term it's always meant reconstruction and it's never meant really looking into the core issues of why things are going bad, why deterioration is taking place, and that's where the role of science also comes in. Uh, so below you can see some images close up of what kind of decorations the wall really has. So as I was saying, it's full, full of tile mosaic work and uh, fresco wall painting. So in the arches of the spandrels of the arches, you have tile work uh, and tile work like, like no other, right? So you've obviously as a people living in India, you've seen tile work in Mughal monuments. This is a very, very uh, famous mode of decoration, not just for Mughals, but all Islamic emperors across the empires in the world. Um, but they always use floral motifs and uh, geometric designs, right? But you never have figurative uh, panels. So here, what's really iconic about this wall is that it's full of uh, figurative imagery where you have uh, you know, animals that were important in the Mughal court represented. You have uh, portraits of men, ordinary men, not men royalty, um, like candlelight bears, sword fighters, uh, men carrying baskets of fruit, um, other objects, people traveling with their animals and caravans. Uh, so there's that uh, category of figurative imagery. Then you have mythological creatures, uh, mostly from Persian mythology, also local mythologies of the subcontinent. Um, so, you know, like Persian angels, demons, uh, mythological uh, animals, you have depictions of European style angels. So also a lot of cross-cultural influence, right? You see European influence, you have Chinese influence. So it's really amazing to have this uh, very large, largest decorated wall in the world full of images you know, from the Mughal court, like probably live scenes that craftsmen had seen in the Mughal court of two people fencing, practicing, you know, elephants uh, chasing horsemen as practice for battle. So all kinds of, you know, it's like an album from the Mughal life um, depicted in a wall made out of tile mosaic work. So it's really, uh, that's really a special thing about this wall. Uh, but when we started this project, we really had no past precedence on how to proceed. And the reason for that is not that we don't have this kind of material or decorative work anywhere else. We do. Uh, I mean, in terms of the kind of tile work this is, these are, these are Persian tiles, uh, you know, that were developed in Irkashan, Iran, in around the 11th century. And it was brought into the subcontinent by the Mughals through Central Asia. So you see this kind of tile work in Central Asia, countries like Uzbekistan. Uh, you see it in Iran, you see it in India and all the Mughal monuments, uh, and you also see it in Pakistan, of course. So, um, you know, it's not that these, this kind of material hasn't been used, it has. Uh, and, you know, the kind of climate we have here, also similar to the climate in India, for example. But we had no standards of procedures of how to preserve this kind of tile work um, in this kind of climate, in the exterior, right? Because it's not an interior facade. So that really changes your entire approach for conservation. Um, 
because anywhere where this kind of work has happened, Iran is mostly they reconstruct everything also in Uzbekistan and also um, work that's been done in India is mostly focused on reconstruction. So what really was new for us was how to preserve the style work. And when I say that, I mean, not dismantle it, not remove it, really just stabilize what's left of it, freeze its existing condition and, um, you know, really treat it for what's left of it. And only then, once we're do left do done doing that, which is 80% of the work, I would say, the last 10-20%, we think of how to present it. You know, should we add color anywhere? Do we need to reconstruct all of that? Uh, so 80% of the work is that, right? It goes behind the surface and it goes in stabilizing and consolidating it. So what we did first thing was involve international consultants, uh, which meant getting a uh, an input and perspective into how things are being done internationally, especially in Europe. So conservation is not a very, very developed field in Pakistan. I think it's actually a bit more developed in India than it is in Pakistan. Um, but still, you know, like in India, you still have some diploma programs. You have conservation being taught in many institutes now. But in Pakistan, it's completely new. Uh, it's not taught in any institute. You don't have short diploma courses that you can do in conservation. And traditionally, it's been a forte of architects and engineers. And again, that shows that that's because conservation has always been about making things new. Uh, so, you know, um, getting together people who specialize in preservation of decorated surfaces. So it's a completely new thing introduced through this project. So we got on board an international consultant uh, whose name is Werner Schmidt. He is a conservator in Italy and his specialty is the preservation of decorated architectural surfaces, which means that any decoration on the wall, painting, style work, mirror work, any type of decoration, any type of craft work, he, for example, specializes in preserving them. So he was involved in the project since the very beginning. Him and his student would come on site and it was like an on the job training for us. So, for example, I joined in 2017, me and four of my other colleagues uh, learned it. it was, so this project has been not only give, been giving employment to people, it's been a sort of an institute, right? A conservation in institute in itself where everyone who's joined the project has learned, has received on the job training. Uh, and I would say first three years of my working on this project was all about learning how to do it on site with my hands, right? And I personally think that was way better than going to for any institute abroad, for example, to learn conservation, to do my master's in conservation. Not that that's not valuable, of course it is, but the kind of knowledge and insight, practical insight I gained into the work, and because of the nature of the work is such that it's all about practicality, right? All about doing hands-on work. Could never have learned the same from a textbook. So, um, you know, as Wajahat Sahib has been talking about how these projects have very community-oriented approach, and they're all about empowering the community by putting back all the revenue generated. Uh, you know, this is the flip side of it is also that a project like the Picture Wall has really been a platform, an institute for people to come together on site and learn the work on site, understand the language of a historic site, how to interact with it, how to approach it, uh, right? So this is a picture, for example, of a Western section of the Western facade that we conserved. Um, and people are very shocked to see uh, it completed because they think that we still have work to do on it because they're like, oh, this still looks old. Uh, but that's exactly the point, right? That's a compliment for us because we want it to look 400 years old. It's almost 400 years old. And it should not look uh, anything like it was made 50 years or even 10 years ago. Because the entire value in it is in the fact that it's historic, uh, right? And again, as a, some, as a scientist involved in the project, um, I get this question a lot that people are surprised to hear that anyone who studied chemistry, for example, has anything to do with this project. And then again, show, goes to show how people expect only artists and artisans to be working on it because they think new things are being made, right? New paintings, they, they think people will be sitting here with paint brushes, um, repainting whatever's lost. But here they see a lot of people sitting with injections, you know, um, acting like doctors for the wall. And that's what real conservation work is all about. Uh, this is a section uh, on the northern side that we have just completed. And this is, so this wall uh, was made by two emperors, right? You had Emperor Jahangir start starting it in around 1624. And the section of this picture where this picture ends, uh, this last tower on the right is where Jahangir's section ends. And then Shah Jahan continues the wall, uh, you know, following the theme exactly as Jahangir had laid out. Um, so while we've, you know, uh, proceeded with this project, there is a lot. So here's the section completed, um, the, the section that you saw in the previous 
this fixture is a section completed right now. And again, you see, so for example, here you see a lot of missing panels, right? That we've just plastered. And the reason we do that is because where we don't have evidence for the lost tile work, completely no evidence, we end up plastering it. Now this is again something that comes with a slight, gives a slight discomfort to, for example, our partners, our government partners, or the public who comes because they're not used to seeing this, you know? The general approach of the government to do conservation here is to make it look very, very sparkling new because, you know, it's easy. It's you, you can do your work quickly because you're just dismantling things and making things new, making a lot of guesses about what's lost, even if you don't have evidence. That means you don't have to do a lot of research. You don't have to go into history. You don't have to carry out any scientific analysis. You don't need to figure out why things are deteriorating because you're just going to remove it and make it new. And you don't need, there's not a lot of uh, intellectual or de conservation debates going on there, right? Work is done quickly, money is made more because there's more that you can measure on the surface area, work that you've done, easy to justify. Everyone is happy, public thinks you've done so much work. Um, but that's, uh, again, that's not how conservation is done. So it's very, you know, one of the challenges we face is in trying to justify our work to um, a government partner who is not used to working like this, you know. So this project, again, has not only been uh, generating employment for so many craftsmen, for example, uh, it's created the first generation of conservators in Pakistan who specialize in this field called, you know, preservation of decorated surfaces. And it's also been a tool to try to change the mindset of the public by setting this huge example, you know, of what a conserved facade should look like. Uh, you know, it shouldn't look like something that was just made a few months ago. Uh, and what, obviously once it's done um, being conserved and presented, it's Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So obviously not uh, back to its original function as it was during the Mughal times, but because this is a space on the northern side of the wall, uh, you have open grassy space there where you can have events. So this is a recent event that happened uh, after we removed the scaffolding from this section. Um, you know, it was a sort of a festival slash bazaar uh, that took place here. And it's a great way to, you know, introduce people to the area, sort of uh, allow them to have some sort of interaction with it because you have such a vast uh, groups of uh, population. You know, you have this young generation who's completely cut off with their history and don't interact with the historic sites anymore. Uh, and then you have this sector of population that have this nostalgic uh, idea of uh, historic monuments don't engage with them anymore but you know have this nostalgic approach that you know once we were this and we were that and then you have this uh, lot who's um, has that nostalgic approach but, but is also trying to make an effort and connect with them you know through research through visits or you know through various different mediums so you know you have to kind of engage all different groups in different ways and this is a good way to engage your young generation who has no uh, familiarity with Mughal historic sites, for example, would never end up coming to the fore in any other circumstances but a festival like this. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the project overall is a success because we have really done a lot of pioneering things, for example, by doing scientific analysis of these of the tile work, for example. So, you know, figuring out the exact composition, uh, involving conservation scientists in Germany, for example, who was able to analyze for us why the deterioration is taking place. And then, you know, the first two, three years of the project were all about this, figuring out the materials, understanding why they're deteriorating, and then coming up with treatments. So I, I, I always love making this analogy that there's really no difference than being than you, what you would be doing if you were a doctor for a patient, right? You have to take the patient's history just like that. You have to study the monument's history, understand what interventions it went through, uh, understand the composition, then understand why the deterioration is happening. And then even when you come up with a treatment, you know, I always say that it's the only science where you cannot rely on formulas. Lab results will not give you 100% directions on what to do on site. It only lays the groundwork. And, uh, you know, something works in the lab, it's just a good starting platform for you. On the site, things will be so drastically different. You have to do so many experimentations, so many hidden trials. We've tried so many different materials. 
for consolidation, for example, so many different ways of applying them, even after we've selected the material. So many factors that you have to look into, economic factors, whether you can ship something that you think is actually working for you, a material, for example. So there's so much that goes into it. And at the end of the day, uh, it's all about improvisation, making your judgments on your feet, you know, on the site. Uh, you have to be impulsive in so many aspects, and that's why I think conservation is a field where nothing but experience matters. You know, the more experience you have, the more comfortably you'll be able to make judgments about things that are unforeseen. And conservation, like on a site like this, is all about unforeseen challenges, right? Um, seven years we've been working on it. I would say first two, three years, we were in the process of developing things from the scratch, right? But still, every section we work on, every panel we work on, Conditions are different. So many times we have to modify our procedures that we, you know, say are 70, 80% quite straightforwardly set up by now. Uh, and, but that's the fun part of it, you know. And the even more fun fact is that there is no record of this wall. Uh, not in historical documents. You guys might know that Mughals are known for having their administrative and daily affairs recorded by coast court historians. For example, each emperor had their own. None of them mentioned the picture wall, even though the construction of so many monuments is mentioned. Uh, the six don't mention it. European travelers who come see the fort mention so many decorations, so many things that they see. They don't mention the wall. Uh, and uh, finally, you have this uh, French uh, superintendent installed by the British um, as the superintendent of the uh, archaeology, ASI. And uh, he is the first person in around 1903 that ends up writing about this wall. He is extremely fascinated by it, and he's the first one to just, you know, call it out for what it is, see very clearly about the descriptions that you have on the wall, the things that are depicted, the different themes. He makes a line drawing of the entire wall, which is very, very useful for us today when we're doing our work. Uh, he made hand tracings of uh, some important panels that he considered important figurative panels, and that's literally the only record uh, we have um, of this wall. So all in all, uh, you know, it's a very, very special project. It's different from the projects in the north in that the projects in the north really focused on structural stabilization and restoration of a lot of architectural facets that were lost. This is a purely preservation based project. Uh, it's the first one in Pakistan uh, and uh, you know, I can. I mean, we can safely say that no other conservation project in the country has approached conservation in a way where science is so heavily involved and the really main focus is on preservation. Uh, we have so many interns who come and learn conservation on site. I would say in the past seven years, at least 30 to 40 uh, people freshly graduated from universities have come, interned, some have stayed, some have left and learned this conservation work, you know, that is really being taught in no institute in the country, no project in the country, learned conservation work on site uh, and moved on to whatever suits them. But some of them have stayed, for example, like me, some of my other colleagues who've decided to make this into a career, right? So really um, uh, big changes that this project is resulting in, in terms of changing people's mindset, setting a new pathway for conservation, generating employment. And of course, the future is going to be more. So once we're, do once we're done working on this project, uh, for example, as this slide is showing, it's going to be used as a venue and it's going to, you know, the, I think the real um, hype about it will start once we're completely um, done conserving it. So another year or two to go with our last section that we've just started, um, around 3000 square meter. It's the last section of the wall that we have just started a few months ago. Uh, and as sad uh, I feel about it saying that it's the last section because, you know, seven years is a long time to work on one project, but it's still uh, exciting to think about it ending and then seeing it, the space being utilized and going back to life. Uh, so, yeah, I can keep going on and on about this project because there's so much involved in it, but I'm going to stop here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can ask me or Vajrat San. Thank you. Zaira, I have a few more slides, then we can ask for the, you know, open the floor for the questions. I think, uh, okay. thank you, Zaira. I mean, uh, thank you for this comprehensive, uh, in-depth analysis and, you know, presentation of how uh, this project is different from the rest of the conservation projects. So you have uh, clearly uh, described that. Other than uh, the picture wall, the, where the focus was, you know, preservation, there are other monuments in the fort, our fort we have installed. Uh, for instance, uh, 
this was an abandoned uh, structure uh, was used as imperial kitchen in Mughal time. It was abandoned for last uh, 30, 40 years. It was used as a political uh, prisoner cell for uh, various times. So, but you know, uh, through our intervention, this has been restored and this is uh, one of the major, uh, you know, cultural attractions. A lot of events related to history of Lahore, you know, music, cultural music events, uh, and major uh, happening in, in, in this part. I mean, these are the, some, some visuals. Uh, just I'll, I'll uh, since it's almost one hour, so let me uh, I'll try to uh, you know complete this uh, these slides in the next two or three minutes. Uh, as a part of picture wall, we have also restored uh, you know different monuments. Uh, this is the famous entrance gate of Lahore Fort, Shahburj Gate. On the left, this was as found condition. On the right, this is how it uh, it is in post uh, conservation state. Uh, some other visuals. Um, we are also working in uh, in the uh, in the Shish Mahal area. Where you know uh, the glass. Uh, I mean, this is the only monument in Lahore Fort where glass has been used, and uh, the level of deterioration uh, uh, we uh, see in this project is immense. So we are doing a similar exercise we did for picture wall by engaging uh, you know international expertise and doing a prototype. Then it will be peer reviewed by experts. Then we will then implement our uh, uh, project. This is another pavilion. Uh, this is how it used to look like before our rest uh, restoration. This was the Lanka Pavilion built by Emperor Shah Jahan. Uh, this is the process of restoration, and now this is how it uh, uh, looked like in, in a current state. It has been fully restored, and uh, these are some other visuals. Uh, other than these, uh, we're also working on some other monuments uh, currently in, in the process. This is Shish Mahal area uh, in, in the context of the Hor Fort. These are some other areas we will be uh, commencing work uh, from uh, this year, uh, next year, uh, landscaping. And, uh, and of course, uh, the major intervention would be uh, interpretation center, the, like, like the one uh, Khan Trust for Culture India has done in, in, uh, in India, in, in Hawaii, uh, interpretation center describing Lahore, history of Lahore, uh, personalities associated with uh, uh, Lahore Fort and Lahore, you know, uh, and different eras, you know, Sikh era, Mughal era, uh, British era, in you know, post-independence era. So this interpretation center will describe uh, everything through uh, through visuals, through, uh, through models, through screens, uh, through, through, through different mediums. Uh, these are some, you know, uh, 3D visualizations of uh, abandoned structures we are proposing to be converted into a museum. I think um, this is end from us. If there are any questions, I, I'm sorry we took, uh, uh, almost an hour to uh, to uh, to describe uh, whatever we are doing. We are doing a lot more, but you know, given the time limit, we have squeezed everything in one hour. And if there is any questions, uh, me and my colleague Zena would love to answer uh, and ask those questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, let me check. Okay. Uh, there is one question. How do you incorporate energy efficiency initiative in your conservation practice? Uh, OK, so I mean, uh, you know, compared to a new structure or new buildings, uh, our material, uh, the way we use uh, you know, the configuration of materials uh, we use in these projects are all indigenous material, you know, in the terms of uh, 
Lahore port, the maximum utilization of material is either brick, brick, locally made brick, and you know, uh, lime. You know, it's like uh, this all material come from the local source, and these are well uh, sufficient to address uh, uh, these, you know, uh, the global impact of energy efficiency. Uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, there is a limitation, you know, but there is a limitation. I mean, for energy efficiency, we could go for, you know, um, smart, uh, you know, supply of electrical supply through uh, these solar panels. But again, you know, it's a different context, different uh, setting where there is a limitation. This is a world heritage. Lahore Fort is particularly a world heritage site. Then you have, you know, uh, some restriction imposed by the local laws and then the International World Heritage Convention, which is the Pakistan is the secretary. So we, we rely on whatever original was done and try to kind of replicate that. But of course, when I say replication, original materials are uh, the best uh, source for a passive kind of energy. You know, we have a thick walls. So, I mean, less, uh, you need less energy to heat or uh, cool down the structures. And uh, I think the best uh, I could quote is, the best example I could quote is the use of lime. And, and we use lime as a binding material for uh, the construction. And, you know, the best part is lime extract carbon. So we are kind of uh, carbon positive in terms of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, emission uh, scale. Okay. But energy efficiency, we have to rely on local materials. <clears throat> we, we have no liberty to use, you know, some solutions available out there in the world because of the context, because of the, the structure of the building and the history attached to it and the conventions which are linked both national conventions or international conventions linked to uh, these historical structures. Sorry, can't hear you. There are any more questions for everybody who is connected online? You can unmute. So there was only one question, so we have tried to answer that. That there is there is no more questions. I I, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. If there are questions, uh, I mean questions from Zena, particularly the use of how we are using science. I mean this is something unique even for Indian context. Still, you know the preservation. The conservation method methodology in India is different than what we are currently practicing in Pakistan. You know, are we still focus on preservation? And in Indian context, it is. I mean, my understanding is it is related to reconstruction. So, if you have a question like that, you can ask Zena or whatever question you want to ask for me. You are welcome. If not, then uh, we say Khuda Hafiz. <laughs> but sorry about the technical issues. We look forward to extending participation to the region. <laughs> 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 